Well, as I said before, this is All Saints Sunday, and the reading that we just had is the gospel reading for All Saints Sunday. That's a traditional reading to have on All Saints, and we're going to talk about that Lazarus reading in a little bit. Of course, it's the story of Jesus going to his friend's house, Mary and Martha, and their brother, who was also his friend, Lazarus, had died, and he's able to call him forth out of the grave. Obviously, it anticipates Jesus' own resurrection, and it's a powerful story to be read on All Saints Sunday. But before we kind of go into all that, and before we go into our theme for today, which is prayer, we're on prayer part two, I just want to talk about how much I love All Saints and how much I love All Saints Sunday. Got a slide up there to remind us what it's all about. It's a day when we look at those who have gone before, those folks who have lived remarkable lives and have devoted themselves to God and through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ have set an example for us. But it's not just a glittering image to be admired, it's something that we can strive for and participate in. And that's why my favorite All Saints song, I'm going to sing to you, uh, starting with the next slide. You may have heard this before. <clears throat> I sing a song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died the ho for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean God helping to be one too. The last verse is my favorite. That's the first verse. Here's the third verse. They lived not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school, or in lanes, or at sea, in church, or in trains, or in shops, or at tea. For the saints of God are just folk like me, and I mean to be one too. Anybody ever heard that song before? Yeah, well, you know, there we go. What's so neat about that song is it says, yes, saints are to be admired, to be um, emulated, but also there's an opportunity for us to participate in this notion of sainthood. It's saying there's not any reason, not in the least, why I shouldn't be one too. And I offer that to you on this All Saints Sunday. Of course, our theme for today is prayer part two, and we're working through the Marks of the Church preaching series. We started with the Apostles' teaching, talked about the fellowship, talked about the breaking of the bread, and then last week Father Todd talked about prayer, and it was why pray, and what's prayer all about. This week's session is how do we pray? Are there some practical suggestions for how we might pray? And, it, you know, it connects to what we just talked about because you don't have to be a saint in order to pray. All saints will have prayed, but you don't have to be a saint in order to pray. It's something that we can all participate in. You don't have to be the most holiest person on your block. Everyone has access to a prayer life. And so I thought today, just quickly, we might take a look at five practical suggestions for prayer. I know that many of us in this room have tried to pray. Maybe we do pray. Maybe we've had some successes with prayer. Maybe we've had some shortfalls with prayer. I thought I'd offer today five successes that I've seen in my own life and also um, in other people's lives so we can take a look at some practical suggestions for prayer. The first one is to allow prayer to flow from real life. So there's a temptation to think sometimes that prayer is like an escape. Prayer is something to be set aside so that you can get away from real life. You've got your real life here with your job and your car and your family and your bills and the stuff of life. And because that's all so hard or trying, or taxing, we've got to get away from it all and go into our cave and find time of escape in prayer. I don't think that's how Jesus prayed, certainly not in this story that we found about Lazarus. You see, in this story, it says that Jesus prayed to heaven. He said, Father, I know that you always hear my prayers. But notice what it said before Jesus prayed about Lazarus. It said that Jesus cried. Jesus wept. He wept for his friend Lazarus. He wept for Lazarus' family. And actually, Bible trivia here, if you ever want to sound really smart, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, it's two words, 
and it is John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept, or Jesus started crying. Shortest verse in the Bible shows us that Jesus' prayer comes out of his real-life emotions. He's not trying to get away from life. He's not trying to escape life. He's embracing and engaging the very stuff of this world. The very tears of this world are what leads him and feeds him into a moment of prayer. So when you pray, you don't have to escape the stuff of your life. You can embrace and engage the stuff of your life. Pray for the people in your life. Pray specifically. Pray for your job. Pray for your church. Pray for your car. Pray for people's names that are on your heart. Pray specifically and allow it to flow out of your real-life experiences so that it's not separated from life, but it's engaged with your life. And that's what Jesus did in this story, so we've got a great example. That's the first suggestion for my practical suggestions on prayer today. Let's see what number two is. Lean on the Book of Common Prayer. You know, sometimes we don't always get a chance to uh, look at the Book of Common Prayer. I brought a nice red one today. Sometimes I use a little black uh, gift edition that was given to me. But this is the Red Book of Common Prayer, and if you go into the traditional church or any Episcopal church across the country, you'll find this prayer book. It is what unites our entire denomination as Episcopalians, and it is full of some of the most beautiful words in our denomination. Some of you heard me give my speech before about the Book of Common Prayer. It is to say that the story of my life is written in the words of this book. I was baptized to the words in this book. I took First Communion and Communion on all successive Sundays to the words in this book. I was married to the words in this book. We buried my father to the words in this book. I was ordained as a deacon to the words in this book. I was ordained as a priest to the words in this book. We baptize Maria to the words in this book. And you can be sure that when I die and am buried, I will have my service, a funeral, to the words in this book. So it's more than just a collection of prayers. The very stories of our lives can be written in the words of this book. And it's so powerful because sometimes we just don't have the words to say when we're trying to pray. Praying off our hearts is a wonderful opportunity as we engage our lives, let let our lives flow forth in prayer, but sometimes you just don't have the words, and so if you have this on your bedside table, it can be opportunity to turn and find those words that we we never would have had ourselves. Um, This is a true story. There was somebody that I went to high school with. She was in my youth group at church, and we kind of grew up together. And a couple years ago on Facebook, um, I saw that her mom had passed away. And so I sent her a message on Facebook, and she messaged me back, and she said, yeah, you know, my mom passed away yesterday. What do you say? You know, I mean, it's Facebook even. What what do I possibly, you know, how do I possibly respond to that? I I said, well, you know, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. Um, I'm going to be home, and I'll be able to come to the funeral. But but what do you even, even say in that moment? And I just had kind of a, a, a strike to offer her this prayer, and I sent it to her on Facebook, and I said, well, this is a prayer for the evening on page 833 in the Book of Common Prayer, but it's especially suitable um, when somebody passes away. And so I sent her a Facebook message that just said this, O oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in thy mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. Good prayer, right? Well, she said thanks very much, and I thought nothing of it. The next weekend, I went to the funeral. And have you ever been to a funeral um, where they pass out those little cards, little laminated cards that says, in memorial of so-and-so? Well, I took a look at it. I flipped it to the back, and there was this prayer. She had taken that and then put it on the laminated card for the funeral. It meant that much to her. Those weren't my words, and thank goodness, because I had no words at that moment. I was able to lean on the prayer book and uh, take the wisdom from generations before and offer that. So, um, you know, when Danielle and I pray in the evening, oftentimes we'll turn to a psalm in this book, or we'll even turn to that prayer in the evening and say it sometimes as we use our own words, but then also lean on, on this volume. 
So that's the second suggestion of the five suggestions for prayer, is to go ahead and lean on the Book of Common Prayer. Ready for number three? Let's take a look. Number three is to set a time and a place. I have a confession. For the longest time, I tried to pray in the morning. I tried to wake up at a certain hour, set my alarm clock, say my prayers in the morning, and sometimes it worked, but oftentimes those eyelids, which had been opened, drooped and drooped and drooped, and a nice meditative, contemplative prayer turned into a nice meditative and contemplative nap or doze. And so as Danielle and I were talking uh, this past season, we said, you know, let's set a time in the evening. And so we set a time of uh, 9.45 before we go to bed. We uh, are all set. We take out our book. We list the folks that we're praying for, and and we do that. And and it's every night now that we are able to say our prayers together. And as that clock, you know, turns to 9.30, we know, uh, okay, 15 minutes, and and then we'll have our prayer time. Let me tell you something about this. Um, sometimes folks will say it, the first time that you try to do something is the hardest, or the first time that you do like a new exercise routine, that's the hardest. That's not the hardest. The first time I think is easy because you're all excited, ready to go. Yeah, I get to the gym, do my exercise, 945, new prayer time. That's the easy one. And the second one is actually pretty easy too because, you know, it went well. The, the hardest one is like the third or the fourth time, right? And then it gets easier. The 10th time, the 20th time, the 30th time, that's a piece of cake. The first and the second time are pretty easy, too. It's that kind of third, fourth, fifth time where maybe it's kind of going okay, and then you sort of get tired, and then you miss one and feel guilty about it. So my offer to you on this number three of setting a time and a place to pray is focus on that third and fourth time. And if you can power through and hit your time that you've, you've said, um, you're going to be fine. On the fifth time, the sixth time, once you get up to the tenth time, it'll just be in your bones, and you'll really start to see your prayer life open up. But really focus and really grit your teeth and ask God to help you, fill you with the Holy Spirit for that third, fourth, and fifth time. Does anybody have a time and a place when they pray? I've been able to say mine. Anybody want to offer, offer yours? Do you have a place in your house that you like to pray? And do you have a certain chair or a certain spot? At the dining room table, right? Anybody else? Yep. So Cindy, oh good, Cindy said on the porch, um, out in nature, to be able to see the sunrise. Pray every time I start my car. Oh. <laughs> That's great. She said every time I start my car. <laughs> yep. At night before you go to bed, and then also before dinner. Praying before a meal, that's a great time. And parents with kids, I gotta tell you, the first couple times, it'll feel good, and then the third and fourth time, your kids might start to roll their eyes and say, oh, why do we have to do this? Power through that third, fourth, and fifth time, and then by the tenth time, you're golden, and all of a sudden it becomes just a fruit-bearing part of your family life. Set a time and place for prayer. That's number three. Number four. Oh, I had a picture up there, which was uh, the bedroom. That's good. Um, Number four, make it your own. I've got two pictures up here because everybody is going to find their own kind of little trick for prayer. Even if you set a time and place, I bet you're also going to have a little personal aspect of yourself where you really are able to get close to prayer. And I was talking to somebody at a retreat one time, and he said, I looked around so long for a quiet place that could be all mine to say prayers, and I was having trouble finding one. If I was in my room, somebody could always bother me or I'd get distracted. If I was at my desk, I could always get uh, sidetracked by something going on at my desk. If I was at work, the phone would always ring. If I was in my car, I could never concentrate on prayer as I was concentrating on the road. They say, I looked around and looked around and looked around and suddenly one day when I was mowing the lawn, he said, I realized nobody can bother me. I'm mowing the lawn. Nobody can hear me. I can't hear anybody else. I can't do anything else except be mowing the lawn. And he said, a peace came over me as I realized I had found my prayer time, which was mowing the lawn. And from then on, I looked forward to be able to mow the lawn, and I prayed while I was mowing the lawn. And that, you know, in addition to his other study and prayer, became a prayer spot for him. That was just his unique little thing. And you'll find yours. 
Uh, another person I read about, actually read about in this little book, person who started praying while they swam laps in a pool. And she said, uh, using the alphabet to keep track of the number of my laps, I focused on adjectives to describe God, starting with the letter A. You are the almighty God, I prayed as I swam lap number one in the pool. You are a benevolent and beautiful God, I prayed as I swam the next lap. You are a caring and creative and can-do God. By the time I had completed 26 laps, an hour had passed and my fears were gone. So she prayed letter by letter, lap by lap, while swimming in the pool, and that was just hers. So make it your own. Find a little trick or a little aspect that is personal to you that you can use for prayer. I want to share two of these little tricks involving prayers at mealtimes. Um, one is on the next slide, which is a prayer die. And you can buy this online on Amazon or at a Christian bookstore. What it is, it's a, a big chunky uh, dice or die, and on each side it has a prayer. A little short little thank you God for this food. And what you can do, because oftentimes people say, oh, I don't know what to pray before a meal. Hand it to one of the kids or hand it to a guest. They roll the die on the table, and then whatever it lands on, well, that's the pray for the evening before the meal. Makes it easy. Um, this one is actually a book that Father Steve gave me. And uh, it is a, a prayer book, but what it does is it flips open, and then it forms a stand, and you lay it on the table, and it's got the same prayer on both sides. And so whenever we have people over for company, um, they say, oh, what can I do to help? I say, well, here, take this book and find a prayer that we want to do before our meal. And they figure it out, flip it open, and then that becomes our prayer before the meal. It's a little trick. It's a little uh, opportunity that we have to make prayer our own. That's number four. Let's review. Uh, number one, allow prayer to come out of real life. Number two, lean on the Book of Common Prayer when necessary. Number three, set a time and set a place. And number four, make it your own. And the last one, number five, is to share this journey with your church. Prayer can be a solitary activity, but let's not have it stay that way. Share your prayer life with your church or with your Christian community. One of the ways that we're going to start doing that at St. Mary's, Father Todd introduced it last week. Does anybody know what this is? This is the green binder that says God's Answers. Okay, maybe Todd mentioned it, but they didn't put the binder together yet. This is going to be on that back table um, right by the sound booth. There will also be one over in the traditional church. And you can use this book however you want. You can come in and say, I am praying for my brother Phil. You can come in and say, thank you for praying for my brother Phil. He is cancer-free. You can come in and take one of these pieces of paper and tear it right out and bring it home and write down your prayers and then bring it back and stick it in. You could send an email to me or to Melissa or Mimi at the office and say, I've got a prayer, I've got an answer to prayer, I've got a prayer request. We'll print it out, we'll punch holes in it, and we'll stick it in the binder. You can include names, or if you don't want to include names, just leave a blank. And we're going to put it in here so that you can be in the knowledge and truth that this whole community is praying together with you. And uh, anytime you all want, you can just go back and flip through some of these pages and let other people's prayers inspire you. And before long, we're going to have a full binder full of prayers, um, answered prayers, success stories in prayer, and let us know that while prayer starts as a solitary activity, it can become a community endeavor. Share your prayers with the community. Finally, a way to share your prayers with your church is through uh, your pledge card. And you'll notice that on this pledge card, there is time and talent and treasure, and then there is prayer. And it's easy to just kind of look at that and say, oh, ho-hum, want to pray for the church. Yeah, I get it. But look at what it says. I, we, will pray for St. Mary's every blank. You could say every week. You could say, I'll pray for St. Mary's uh, every month, on the first of the month. Or you could even say that I'll pray for St. Mary's every day. And Danielle and I put down every day, and we've uh, been challenging ourselves to do so. It's going great. If you do every day, 
really go for it. You know, don't just put it down and then forget about it. Make a copy of this pledge card, stick it on your refrigerator, and say, I pledged in the same way that I pledged to give a certain amount of money, in the same way that I pledged to be active in a certain ministry area. I pledged, and I put my name on this card and put it in the house that I'll pray for St. Mary's every day. You know, if we got a couple hundred of these cards that said that a couple hundred of people were praying for St. Mary's every single day, we would feel really good about the success of our mission and ministry coming up in 2013. So by writing it down, by telling folks about it, by using some of these practical suggestions for prayer, you can join me. You can join those of us who pray for St. Mary's every single day. Make it part of your life. But don't do it just for your church. Do it for you. Do it for your heart. Do it for your family. Pray every day, pray without ceasing, set a time and a place, make it a reality, and then watch the ways that God will bear fruit through that prayer. Good luck, God bless, let me know how it's going, and let's pray without ceasing. Amen.